ideas in cyber warfare for a long time, right? And we've made movies about it, a lot of movies. Um, some have grounding in reality, some do not have grounding in reality. Um, there's one that's pretty accurate, one Academy Award, um, that's Sneakers. That one's fairly accurate as far as hacking goes. Um, obviously, war games, everybody dreams, okay? Of course, we, we love Whopper and we want it to make decisions for us, which I think is pretty much what drove the idea for Evil Eye, anybody that's seen that movie. Most of the, ha most of the, uh, <laughs> Most of the uh, hacking in that wasn't actually done by a person, it was actually done by a computer. Um, but the idea is that if you can control everything, uh, then no one can fight back against you. And that's really sort of the, the core idea behind cyber warfare. If you can remove an enemy's ability to function, uh, and today t technology pretty much controls most things in life, especially for a lot of countries that leapfrog uh, a lot of grounded development stages. But we have grounded copper wire networks in the US. Countries like Estonia, Latvia, Turkey do not have these networks because they leapfrog the stage in development in order to sort of foster economic development. Okay, the, there are very real capabilities um, with cyber warfare. Um, these have been demonstrated recently, and I'll get to that in later slides. Um, taking down power grids, taking down banking systems, taking down transit authorities, communication networks, all of this stuff has actually been done in the real world by large entities, arguably by nation states, and I'll get into that later. Um, the, the internet offers the perfect environment of plausible deniability, basically. You can do almost anything you want on it, and as long as you're really good at what you do, no one essentially can prove that you were the one that did it. They can have a pretty good idea that you were the one that did it, but they can't prove it. Um, there are starting to be more advances in tracking technologies and what's called the network identification, network discovery. Um, so it's becoming a little bit less feasible to get away with everything. Um, but it's still, it's still very possible. Um, and I mean, there are literally examples. I, I actually couldn't put this um, video up because this one, that was very, very much copyrighted. But um, the, a little while ago, the national government paid uh, a small consultant firm to demonstrate the most dramatic, effective cyber warfare capabilities they could possibly think of. And so they literally blew up a power transformer using a computer, um, which brought would have brought down a, a, basically a power grid of an entire city if it was the relay station that the transformer belonged to. Um, and it's basically all they did was they brute force attacked an area, which means that they used a program to hack out a password to get, out, get control of the server, and they lowered the cooling temperature um, so that the cooling temperature, sorry, raised the cooling temperature of a transformer so that it wasn't being cooled anymore. It literally just melted and exploded. Um, so, I mean, there, there are very real physical capability, capabilities for cyber warfare, not just in, in the computer world. Um, the most common methods that are used to attack um, are SQL injections, which are basically just sort of giving a computer an instruction, one instruction that it can't handle. It causes a computer to sort of redo a whole bunch of instructions to itself and then it just overloads and shuts down. Um, brute force attacks, which I just told you about, are essentially just using a program to hack a password out. Um, a dictionary attack, which is a different version of a brute force attack. Essentially, you have a program that has an entire dictionary alphabet in it, or not, sorry, not alphabet, dictionary of words in it, and then it uses those words to extrapolate a password from something. Um, worms, which most people, um, most people know what worms are. I mean, essentially just a computer virus or a program designed to eat out holes in a computer, essentially a little niche for itself to cause problems later on. Uh, and then DDoS attacks, which are now the most common form of attack for cyber warfare. It's a distributed denial of service attack is what it's called. Essentially what it is, is one person plants bots or other computer programs on a set of other computers, which distribute other software to a whole bunch of other computers. And those computers then launch mass attacks, thousands and thousands of computers strong, Against, uh, against other computers, usually one target or only a few targets. This is an example of a DDoS attack right here. So you have one attacker that gives instructions to a couple of computers, and then those couple of computers spread, uh, spread programs to other computers, making them what's called a zombie computer, and they all attack essentially one target. So this is what a DDoS attack looks like in cyberspace. So the attack originates from here, and these are the handlers that were in that other diagram, all attacking one target. And you obviously can't have enough colors or lines to show what really happened. This is an attack that took place against Georgia in 2008, which I'll discuss in a little bit. 
uh, and it amassed something like 48,000 computers, roughly. Um, it's a lot of computers attacking one government that I think only had 52 servers for the entire central government and what was being run there. Um, so essentially it just brought it down. The attack only lasted two hours. The entire country's infrastructure was ruined for about a week. Um, and that was ironically right before uh, Russia invaded them with a physical assault. Um, so, uh, and a little bit further back than that though, um, there are three sort of main uh, past organizations for cyber warfare. And they were groups versus nations, sort of like um, uh, the term in cyber warfare is hacktivists. So activists essentially that are really computer savvy and will use their knowledge to take down computer networks. Um, groups versus groups. Um, this was really prevalent uh, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflicts. Um, when computers started to get a little bit more developed, the Palestinians would take down Israeli websites, Israeli religious websites, and put up their own propaganda. Um, and then nations versus nations, which um, most of this um, came out of cyber espionage, essentially, just trying to hack computers using sort of those brute force or dictionary attacks that I was talking about before, in order to get some information, um, whether it's um, troop strengths in a certain area, strength of a GDP, information about other countries that has been gleaned through another form of espionage. But essentially, it was just about stealing information. Um, and then we have sort of the patriotic hacking, which is a different version of hacktivist hacking. And that, that is actually a newer development of hacking that's sort of butt up against the new, more modern age of cyber warfare, um, which is essentially the nation versus nation warfare, which is the other, the third major kind of warfare. Um, we're just finally starting to see whole countries attack whole countries using just computers. Um, so in recent history, when we get into the nation versus nation state, um, in 2007, uh, the Estonian government was looking at moving a Soviet war memorial. So now they're an independent country. They don't necessarily want to have a strict government tie to, the, to a past Soviet regime. There's a Soviet war sol soldier memorial from World War II in the center governmental square. And they wanted to move it outside of the governmental square to the cemetery where all the Russian soldiers who died in that area were located at. And they thought it would sort of solidify the World War II theme to the statue and the cemetery and they were going to erect a governmental statue in its place. There are a lot of people with Russian descent in Estonia, they didn't like this, so um, essentially they had a large attack on one day, the day that they promised to move the statue, which actually they didn't end up moving on that day, brought their entire country to a standstill. Um, Estonia is one of those countries that I laid out before that sort of skipped a stage in development, right? They don't have the grounded copper wire networks. So they have, basically their entire government is run over the internet, and most of it is wireless. Uh, their banks came crashing down, uh, and 98% of Estonia's banking is done online. Uh, most of their banks don't actually exist in any physical sort of form. Um, they're just websites that you do business with, essentially. Um, and their whole government was brought to a standstill. They couldn't even respond. They had actually had to use, go out of the country, some of them had to go out of the country and use landlines just to get help, uh, to get consultants <coughs> for during the cyber attack. Um, a lot of the IP addresses for these attacks that actually where the attacks originated from were from the Kremlin, literally within the Kremlin in Russia. It doesn't come as a huge surprise to a lot of people who know, you know a, a little bit about the politics of the area, but Russia vehemently had denied the attacks. A year later, Russia was embroiled uh, with a conflict with, uh, in Ossetia around Georgia, um, specifically against Georgia. Um, one day in August in 2008, the same thing happened to Georgia. Their whole government came crashing down, and uh, essentially uh, Russia invaded 24 hours later. So that's a little bit beyond a coincidence. Um, and again, some of the exact same IP addresses were used in the attack. So we really, this is sort of like the first example of a real country actually attacking another country using computers. And then they linked it up sort of what's called a hybrid invasion. They attacked the computers, brought the entire country to a standstill, and then invaded. Um, now, Independence Day of last year, I don't know if any of you heard about this at all, um, about 21 of our websites in our government were brought down using a really, really simplistic attack. Um, and this actually is getting into um, what my paper is, is actually about. It's about U.S. defense capabilities. How capable is the U.S. of defending against these attacks? Um, and a lot of you, you can say, okay, well, 21 websites, we have a lot of websites in the government. Okay, yeah, well, the FBI's website was brought down. Um, the FBI's email servers were brought down. 
uh, the FBI's network connections to other departments were brought down. And the FBI deals a lot with the Department of Homeland Security. So there's a problem. And the problem doesn't start with that, or doesn't end with that, excuse me. It starts there. Um, further into it, I mean, it wasn't a or highly orchestrated attack. It was run by what they think was two people who set it up in their spare time. And they brought a good portion of the government's defenses down, um, at least communications. Uh, now recently, within uh, the last couple of weeks, I don't know if anybody's seen this, Google was hacked. Um, Google fought back. Uh, the hackers were in China, and Google brought down 14 servers in China. Uh, because they located the servers where the attacks were originating from, and they killed the servers with their own, their own attacks, essentially. Um, I was really excited to hear about this. I was <laughs> but um, it, it, was, it was a lot of fun. Um, this is actually what the attack looked like. Um, Which attack? Uh, the, the attack against Google, the original one. It lasted for two hours. Um, and, oh, excuse me, no, this is, this is the attack on Georgia. I'm sorry. Um, so it's, this is the one that lasted two hours. And the, this is the communication going into their servers, okay? So it spikes for two hours straight and then essentially just sort of tapers off as the attack ends. That was enough to bring an entire country's government down for about five or six days. Um, it, it doesn't actually take a lot when the country's not prepared, and that's a lot of people in the federal government are sort of screaming about this. Um, that especially that in 2009, a little while later, our country is obviously not prepared. Um, so the general components that everybody sees of cyber defense, like certain things that we need to essentially protect and better organize, right? Infrastructure, technology, and logistics. Obviously. We can't really even locate who our or who the perpetrators are for these attacks. So technology is obviously extremely important. Infrastructure is important because that's what we're protecting. Um, we don't want transportation to go down. We don't want the power grid to go down. Uh, we don't want, uh, you know, I mean, the banking system obviously, which is it's kind of down anyway. But we don't want this to go down any further than it already is. Um, they're just sort of the bedrocks of what people concentrate on when they focus on cyber defense policy. Um, currently, what I want to look at in my paper is how we train the people who defend the country against cyber attacks. Um, and almost conversely, also, what are our offensive capabilities? Because part of the defensive capabilities of a country is what it's able to do to another country. Um, and if anybody has any points on this or counterpoints, please bring them up. Questions, please bring them up because this is a really broad area. So I'm not obviously hitting on anything, or on everything, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, I got something. Um, but uh, there's sort of the, uh, a, an element of what's called a deterrent in uh, military lingo, right? In the Cold War, we had the nuclear deterrent. Uh, cyber warfare is not exactly the same because we might be able to detect where a nuclear missile is launched from but if we can't detect who is attacking us with a computer, uh, if we attack somebody we don't, we're not sure is the perpetrator, obviously there's some negative ramifications. Especially because one of the things that our country holds to still in military doctrine today, the nuclear deterrent is a viable option in retaliation for a cyber attack. So if someone attacks our country with a computer, it is actually in our policy books right now that it's okay for our country to attack them with a nuclear missile. And that seems sort of problematic to me, at least. I don't know. Maybe if I've lost you all already, maybe it doesn't seem problematic. Already. No, I'm kidding. Um, but um, so there are other things that need to be changed in our defense policy. Obviously, the organization of it, um, the training of the personnel so that we can actually locate who's attacking, um, and the type of training. Uh, right now, uh, the training is front loaded rather than progressive. And so this, this is sort of the other side of what I'm looking at. Um, the other side of the argument of changing uh, the model, the training model, to a more progressive model is to use what's already in place and just fund it a little bit better, or a lot better, depending on who's talking about it. Uh, the, the training method that's in place is front-loaded, so it would be akin to somebody coming out of a cyber, a computer, excuse me, a computer security program in a university, going to their place of employment, and then getting trained from there for a few weeks or four or five weeks to get them up to speed on the locality of what they're doing. So with, with, within whatever organization is um, employing them. And then sort of 
letting them go on their own. And they would be supervised, but they'd be pretty much on their own. Most people don't, essentially don't uh, communicate a whole lot with their, um, you know, with their coworkers or anything like that. And they don't get training from outside of their departments. Most businesses that have IT departments have very, you know, very small IT department, and then the business is a much bigger entity. Um, and it's the same way that the federal government operates. They train their employees the exact same way. It's a little bit larger, obviously. They have a little bit more, a few more resources than a normal business would have dedicated to computer communication because so much goes on behind the scenes with computer communication, especially within the federal government. Um, the current model, like I said, is the traditional training method. This is literally a view of the Air Force's um, cyber, uh, sorry, it's a cyber defense battalion, I think is the name of it. Um, so it's outside of Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, and it's a whole bunch of people staring at computer screens. And literally, this is on a blog post talking about, um, I, obviously, the, the blog post is actually on a governmental website, so I don't really, I didn't really think I could pop it up here. But um, the, uh, they're, they're talking about how they don't converse with their coworkers and they sit right next to them. Uh, I mean, that, that's not really conducive to training or understanding any sort of, any form of education at all. Um, they have a traditional physical layout. Um, so again, just cubicles or even just a line of computers and people looking at screens. Um, there, there, are, there are reasons that you want to maintain the status quo. Um, maintaining, we have a lot of contractors that do cyber defense for us, which surprises most people. Um, there are currently something like nine to ten times as many contractors that do cyber defense uh, compared to uh, actually ingrained um, first party workforce within the government that actually do cyber defense. And most of those are in the NSA uh, or the DHS. So that comes as a surprise to a lot of people, but it's more effective because we have very strange sort of sporadic needs when it comes to cyber defense. There will be a security issue and we hire on contractors and those contractors deal with the security issue. The security issue goes away and we stop the contract. It's very economically beneficial. Um, what they want to do is just enlarge the government workforce a little bit to give a slightly larger core workforce within the government. And then that way they are a little bit more prepared is the argument. Um, and then more money, obviously, which is what would take um, buffering technolo technological equipment, buffering the workforce a little bit, increased pay grades, things like that. The economics are, are we're not there, I wouldn't say, until recently. Um, Obama just passed, uh, a, or just signed a bill uh, that actually appropriated enough money to hire 1,000 new cybersecurity workers um, through just through the DHS. That's not through any other department. Um, so the money is there now, and I would I would argue that so is the ability to reorganize if it's if it's a viable option. Uh, another problem with sort of reorganizing the the way the system functions now is that a lot of people are, a lot of the departments, people who have worked in DC and people who have read a lot about the way the departments function in DC know that those departments do not want to give up a shred of power that they believe they have over any kind of situation. Uh, the NSA is not going to want to trade up its, its computer security algorithms with say the FBI or the DHS. They might give them a little bit of advice here and there, but they're not going to trade up any of the knowledge that it took to make those, any of the, the hard knowledge that it took to make those programs. That's part of the problem with working any, anything within the DC bureaucracy, is that a lot of people sort of cling to the power that they want, and then they go ahead and say, well, we, we need more responsibilities here. Whether or not it comes down to the fact that they actually want the responsibilities or you know, the appropriations that go with it. Um, so changing the sort of you know, backlogged model of thinking in DC is going to be really hard for anybody to do, um, especially in a short period of time. Um, some of the other ideas that have come out um, recently uh, involve changing career career tracks. There's no actual career track that involves cybersecurity in the federal government. Um, the governmental distinction, or uh, distinction, sorry, um, organization. It's like a moniker that they give to each job title. The uh, the job title they have here is just computer specialist. Um, and that covers pretty much everyone who works on a computer in DC that works primarily with computers. That's a lot of people. So the idea that 
um, one of the uh, one of the papers that I've read recently called Cyber Insecurity, um, which is an, an analysis essentially of how uh, how the cyber warfare policies have been affected in the U.S. Um, one of the criticisms that they said was that if they actually create separate career, career tracks for all these cybersecurity people, give them a chance to stay in the same field for a little while so they don't have to move outside of the field in order to get a pay raise. Because within the computer specialist track, there's not a lot of pay raises above you know, where you enter at. It's just a standard sort of 3% per year. And there's no real career advancement because to become a supervisor, you actually have to leave that career track. It doesn't make a lot of sense, but I mean, it, it is DC. Um, so, Another one was to raise scholarships to the NSF, more heavily fund those scholarships so that students, sort of like students in SI and students in the computer science department that are graduate students here, can get a really high level of funding to, in exchange, work for, say, six years for the government, doing cybersecurity policy work, cybersecurity coding work, things like that, with different departments. So not just work with one, one department, but do two years with the DHS, do two years with the NSA, do two years with the CIA, something like that. Um, and then there's also was money. Uh, every, everybody, everybody wants to put more money into the problem and then cut the, cut the deficit, right? So that's, that's, the, that's part of the problem. Uh, the government obviously, <laughs> spending freeze, right? <laughs> we don't have any more money to give to anybody. So um, that, that's, that's part of the problem too. And these are actually new ideas that they're coming out with. And the new ideas are still, we need more money to defend against everything. Um, now, the, sort of the, the point that I've taken so far, the stance that I've taken so far in my research, um, and this has gone back before this class, um, not with this particular topic, but in cyber warfare in general, um, is that we should be looking at the countries that are doing it better than we are um, and try to understand how they're doing it, how they're educating their IT professionals, and not necessarily emulate it 100%, but at least use it for the basis for us to educate our IT professionals a little bit better. Um, the, the obvious example is Russia, because they've obviously been involved in full-blown national cyber attacks. Russia is a very, very interesting case. They don't have, Russia has nationalized, uh, I think it's a company of men, so it's like 200 men and women who are essentially designated as hackers. They have like a hacking unit. Um, but they don't do anything. That's the funny thing. They, they had nothing to do with the attack on Georgia. The entire attack on Georgia was perpetrated by what's called the RBN, or the Russian Business Network, which is essentially the Russian Mafia, but they're all computer geeks. Um, they, they all get paid essentially to hack people's websites, hack your credit card number, things like that. That's where they make their real money. Um, but there's a really good chance since they actually admitted to perpetrating, or some of the people who are known to be affiliated with them admitted to perpetrating the attack on Georgia and Estonia, that they're being employed by someone else because directions were coming from certain areas within Russia, and we know that directions were coming within certain areas in Russia for the Estonia attack. And then for the Georgia attack, there was nothing happening, and then literally 24 hours before Russia literally invaded the country, a cyber attack came through and brought the whole country down, which is a little too much of a coincidence. Um, but the RBN, if you look at the RBN instead of Russia, their training methods are very unique. They use computer forums uh, in sort of a journeyman apprentice relationship way. So they get instructions, people who are really experienced computer hackers will give instructions, here's a new hacking tool, here are tips how to use it, here, you know, here's my advice from what I've learned by using it, Go and have a little bit of fun, and while you're at it, here's some IP addresses in the United States that are pretty easy to attack using this tool. And so, a few of these, you know, youngsters, if you want to call them that, people who are new to hacking, will go in, download these tools, use them on the websites, you know, associated with the instructions, and get better. And two or three of these couple hundred guys who go in and utilize this tool and attack will become journeymen, and then they start the process again, and they pass it down. And they share this. They share these methods over a number of websites through a number of different styles of hacking. So it's not just like there's a group of them in St. Petersburg, which is where the RBN is based. There's a group of them in St. Petersburg, and there's a group of them in another city, and there's a group of them in another city in Latvia. So there are different ideas being exchanged between all these different hackers and all these different hacking websites. And there's a, and then so there's a cross sort of educational flow going on with different tools that are being created, and then there's a downward educational flow that's recycling. 
So there's a downward educational flow going from journeyman to apprentice, and then the apprentices become the journeyman, and the cycle repeats. It's a very, it's not very complex, and it doesn't seem very strange, but our government doesn't do that. Our government is a very traditional sort of method. We employ people at a bottom level and almost leave them there. Um, China, on the other hand, is really interesting. Not because uh, we know a lot, but because we don't know a lot. We know a lot about what they've published. China has published, people in China have published more papers on cyber warfare than any other country in the world. We also know that China has a whole battalion of trained cyber defenders and cyber attackers. We don't know what they do. Um, and as far as we know, they actually haven't done anything. So it becomes difficult. Um, there's been some recent papers that I'm hoping to actually pull for this, um, for this project uh, that have been written on it. I haven't had a chance to get to look at. Um, but they've, they really have actually uh, gone, made, made, I would say made some headway as to figuring out um, how China's planning on using, um, using their capabilities. So that's, that's really essentially where I'm at, I guess, with, uh, with the project so far. Um, I'm, I'm really looking at the, the largest part of it, um, focusing on what other countries have done so far that we know, and using that to sort of emulate uh, propositions and recommendations for what the US should do, I suppose. Questions about anything? More comments? Comments are good too. Yes? I have a quick question, actually. You mentioned that the US has a policy of a nuclear attack against cyber warfare. Yeah. Is there any particular policy or act or something else that you would Absolutely, yeah. Um, to build up the cyber deterrent. So if someone's going to attack us using, using a computer, obviously I would I would prefer, and there's actually a, been a recent paper where the advisors in the paper actually took the same standpoint, that they would prefer us build up a cy sort of a cyber deterrent. So if someone else can attack us using computers, it would be much more beneficial if we could detect and attack them using the same methods. Um, so it's more like a like reprisal situation. So if you can find the person who's attacking you and then just take their computer out, essentially, um, would just be much more, obviously, politically and uh, you know economically and morally a uh, better method of dealing with it, I suppose. So. Sure. I had one other question. I thought when you were explaining the, the DD, DDoS, DDoS yeah. method of attacking, it just seems interesting that they should have an attacker and then handlers and then a fleet of zombies, we call them. Mm -hmm. Like, is there a strategic reason why they should have handlers with intermediate step? Um, why well, would they just go to... It's, it's economical. The, uh, it's economical because you can filter the instructions. Um, so that person only has to write, say, like, you know, a few lines of code and then pass it on to the handler, which is essentially, a, in some cases, another zombie. So that computer could be automated to that program. Um, and then that program actually distributes the software. So it serves a couple of purposes. It, um, it makes things a little bit more like time-wise, chronologically economical, I suppose, if you want to look at it that way. So it, it takes the hacker less time to perpetrate the attack, and it's much less likely that someone's going to be able to trace that hacker back through the chain. The more steps back to the hacker, the less likely. Um, in fact, the, the attack on the US in, on Independence Day just this past year, um, they originally thought that the attacks were perpetrated from South Korea, but when they kept tracing the IP addresses, they found out that it was more likely that it originated in London. So it's more of a strategic advantage than a technical advantage, right? Right, it's absolutely, well. yeah. It serves both purposes, but it's much more of a strategic advantage, right. yeah. Do most of these, uh, we've been discussing a lot of their offensive capabilities. Do Russia and China have very good defensive capabilities as well? Cyber warfare? Yeah. Well, we don't know because they haven't been attacked yet. <laughs> so. Uh -huh. um, or, well, have you identified not any countries that you think have good defensive capabilities, or is this really... Es Estonia, since the attack in 2007, has um, actually fought off about seven or eight other full-fledged attacks since then. Um, and they're actually the location, later in the year, in, uh, in 2007, or sorry, 2008, uh, NATO established the Cyber Defense Center of Excellence, spelled in the British method, so in the C. Um, and uh, that's actually... It's in Tallinn, too, which is the capital of Estonia, which is where most of the stuff that happened in 2007 originally, or uh, sort of ground zero. 
Um, and they're actually putting out a lot of, they just, one of the papers on China actually was published out of that center um, for defense excellence. Uh, the one I'm waiting to read. It's getting translated right now, actually. But um, I don't really study it. Um, but yeah, actually, so that would be one of the one of the best examples, probably. Um, the other best example, which isn't a, a country, even though they kind of are a country, is Google. Um, they, they had one of, the, only one of their servers, I think, uh, went down. And Google has a lot of servers. Google has more servers than um, all the countries except for the US that were attacked, actually. So if you combine Georgia and Estonia and the other countries, that Google by itself has more servers than those countries. Would you lump in also their um, threatening of pulling out of China entirely as part of cyber defense or no? Yeah. You could use that because, I mean, it's an economical deterrent. So yeah. No, that's a good idea, actually. I may have missed this if you talked about it, but is there a, is there like a uh, a treaty on cyber warfare? They're working on it right now, actually. Um, NATO is trying to have one and the, or start trying to make one, and so is the UN. Um, as as far as far as I can tell, it's just going to be words on a piece of paper, because and only because the internet is such an area for plausible deniability. Um, I mean, you can literally pay off one hacker now to, I mean, with the DDoS attack, which is pretty old method now. Um, you can literally pay one hacker to attack, you know, a large portion of the country. Yeah, I'm surprised that they're still effective on sophisticated targets. Yeah. It's it, such an ancient method. It, it is. Um, I mean, it's, it's, the idea has been around since the internet became sort of you know, proprietary in the 90s, but, um, or not proprietary, sort of wide, widespread. Um, but they didn't really become truly effective until really what, or at least no one knew how effective they could be until the attack on Estonia. Um, there have been some limited stuff between China and the US in about 2003, 2004, but nothing was really, nothing was really big, you know, bring down an email server here or there. Nothing, nothing as drastic as the, as the sort of the events that I laid out um, in recent history. Do you think if uh, the attack that was launched on Georgia or Estonia was launched on the US, what, to your knowledge, would have been the damage? Um, the attack that was launched on the 4th of July was similar, but it wasn't nearly as large. There were only about 10,000 computers involved in it, so it was about, about a, a fifth as effective. Or I, I shouldn't say as effective. It, uh, the effectiveness also depends on what the targets are. Um, but the, the size of the attack was about one fifth as large, and it brought down you know, like all those websites. Um, oh, uh, not just the websites, but the services they provide, which uh, essentially the core communications between a lot of departments of the US government. Um, so, it, I mean, pretty effective, I guess. But it depends on what's been done between then and now, too. Um, a, lot's, a lot's been done. A lot of personnel have been hired. Um, at the end of 2009, Obama um, signed a, a bill, and the Secretary of Defense Gates signed a bill as well, um, making a U.S. cyber commander, essentially. So uh, in, in the Department of Defense, there's actually now finally the top-level leadership for cyber warfare, so, which was one of the other problems. When you mention the cyber commander, exactly what kind of um, power influence does that position have? In the I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say necessarily power. Um, organizational influence would probably be more um, more accurate. Uh, so he he probably since he's a higher tier within the Department of Defense and uh, would be a military officer. Actually, is the everyone who holds this position is a military officer uh, right now? I think it's a lieutenant general of the Air, Air Force, the Army. Um, but uh, basically, that person would have the the authority to move soldiers around within the military under the guide of the Secretary of Defense to reorganize them for cyber warfare. Um, essentially, it's uh, right now, until things get a little bit more solidified, I'm sure the person's twiddling their thumbs a little bit. Um, but for the most part, um, it's basically like one step in the right direction is how, kind of how I see it. It's a little bit more towards a concrete organizational structure so that someone can say, Okay, we're being attacked. Uh, you need to do this. You need to do this. You need to do this. Having someone at the top who is actually a specialist with that knowledge is, is very helpful. Yeah. Sort of touched on it on the training slide, but what um, mechanisms are there for actually detecting how effective the defense mechanisms are? Without um, we run a lot of war games in the cyberspace. Actually, the um, the military academy at West Point started running them four years ago, and they're doing them every year now. And they actually uh, do it, they, they call it a, a cyber warfare live fire range now. Um, they have a building that they actually like, 
you know, put down camo drapes on and stuff like that. It's really ridiculous, kind of. But uh, they, they basically essentially seal everyone out of the computer lab, and people from the NSA and CIA will try to hack servers that um, the officers have, or the officer trainees, anyway, at West Point are trying to guard. Um, and these are just trainees, too. And the NSA and CIA um, combat back and forth, uh, so almost in the same sort of training field, I guess, is what I call it. Uh, but they don't trade secrets, though, um, which is a little ridiculous, in my opinion. Um, I mean, especially with the CIA and the, and the NSA, they're, they're both pretty secret agencies. I don't think they're going to be spreading anything around. Um, but, yeah. what, what are the motives of these people who are doing this? Um, for the RBN money, um, for uh, another nation state. Of the RBN, uh, the general assumption now is that the RBN got paid to, to perpetrate the attacks on Estonia and Georgia uh, from Russia. There's no money trail, but... Are they hacking the banks to steal money, or they hack credit card numbers, or something like that? That's how the RBN started, yeah. actually. The, um, the, the whole idea about getting, you know, have these people pull, you know, a million credit card numbers from, you know, Chase Bank or something like that, right? Um, we hear about those data breaches all the time, especially uh, Don Blumenthal actually covers them a lot in his, uh, his uh, enterprise security course, uh, which is actually how I got into this topic in the first place. Um, so those million credit card numbers... Someone who gets a hold of those doesn't really know what to do with them. Um, I mean, they don't really know how to make money, so they sell them to someone who does know how to make more money. Off. You might get fifty thousand dollars for. This is, I'm just throwing this number out. You might get fifty thousand dollars for selling off a million credit card numbers. Well, the person who paid fifty grand for them will extrapolate, say, thirty thousand of those credit card numbers that can make him five grand a piece or something like that. And that's the RBN guy. Um, so the people who sell the credit card numbers and the personal ID, the, the PII, or personal, personally identifiable information, um, the person who sells it doesn't really know what to do with it, and so they sell it up, sort of up a chain until it gets to the RBN. Or the, the actually um, the organized organized crime in the U.S. is actually starting to get pretty good at it now. Uh, the Italians finally caught up to the Russians. You know, your insight into the state of the art within the Department of Army is interesting. What's the Navy up to? Uh, the Navy's actually uh, got, they're, they're not as high speed as the Air Force is really, who, as far as the four branches right. are concerned, yeah. the Air Force is really who's at the, the pinnacle yeah. of it. The Army's catching up quickly. Navy's a little bit behind. The Marine Corps hasn't really done a whole lot, but I think that's because they rely on the Navy to do most of it. Yeah. Um, the, the Navy is actually now jo under joint command of the Air Force. The, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the Cyber Readiness Brigade. Cyber, cyber readiness battalion. Uh, so they're actually under command of the Air Force, which is really strange. Um, really? But it seems, yeah, so that's... far it seems to be, they seem to be getting along, um, but you don't really hear a whole lot of actual like you know, individual communication. That's very interesting them. because of their heritage of being more advanced in the intelligence areas. Yeah, it is. It really is. Um, they actually are, are starting a new um, sort of recruiting campaign. They're trying to get people at the enlisted level that mm -hmm. uh, are just really interested in computers out of high school, yeah. and they're going to try to build it up, supposedly. Um, because part of the funding that went towards the 1,000 new hirees for um, the DHS, um, there's another set of funding actually that went to the Navy so that they can sort of bolster their defenses too. Okay. Um, they actually changed their slogan recently to, what was it? Oh, um, life, liberty, and the pursuit of all who threaten it, I think, or something like that. And so the, the goal is to take like cyber terrorists down there. Right now, actually, there's a, an FBI cyber um, cyber specialist who does cyber crime mostly, but he comes in and talks for Don Blumenthal in his classes. Um, and he used to work in D.C. Um, and when he worked in D.C., he literally told me, um, I'll, I'll, obviously I won't say who he is, but uh, he literally told me that China attacks us every day, literally. IPs from within the Chinese government. And they, you know, probing whatever they're doing. I mean, essentially now, I, I would say it's probably for the most part to get information, um, but sort of like a subset of that would be to get information on what's vulnerable and what's not vulnerable. Yeah. So right now it's just preparation. Um, there might, but China's main motivation might be, I mean, you know, if there's any conflict in the future over say like Taiwan or something like that, um, that's what a lot of people are worried about and as far as cyber defense well, in the country is concerned. So if they, if they had that motive, Like to add Google to, and you were right. talking about the FBI and this and that and the other thing. Uh, it, 
The one on the 4th of July wasn't a, was not a national attack, but it was an example that I just used uh, about cyber defense. So about how the country might have to defend itself against one that's really not so strong. And we're not actually even that good at protecting against those. Uh, so like Bobby was saying, yeah, it's really quite a surprise that we still can't defend against those. And it's really that old, and it was really only perpetrated by a small number of people, not a nation. So, so the nations are not involved so much? Um, not a lot. Um, but the, the danger is that they're capable of it, and they've chosen so far, aside from Russia, obviously, um, they've chosen so far to not be publicly involved with it. Whether or not there's been something large that's happened, that's, that's the only time we actually hear about it, uh, when the media gets a hold of it and they say, okay, you know, all these services from 21 different departments came down, how did it happen? And then they start tracing these steps through. How do they protect, what kind of protections do they have against the to have enough enough employees and highly trained enough highly trained employees excuse me and highly trained enough to recognize when there's a request coming into a server that's not a legitimate request when there's something that's been repeated a lot within say five or six seconds um, so the fact that only one server was brought down at Google is pretty impressive because that means that within say 30 30 seconds to a minute somebody who stares at a computer screen literally all day was able to wake up realize that something bad was going on and shut it down um, that's the goal as far as personnel training is concerned. The technological aspect is finding servers that are capable about, of doing that autonomously. Um, the new one is uh, it's actually open sourceware too, which would make me really happy. Um, is uh, it's called the Squid OS. Um, it's based off of uh, Linux and it's something that was developed by DARPA, I think. Um, but the Squid OS is uh, basically a server that was originally designed, server system that was originally designed to speed communication. So it would cache, you know items in, it, in itself and then speed, use that to speed up communications essentially. Well, they, they figured out that you can actually sort of flip that around. So if too much comes in, it can cache a piece of information and say, okay, I just got this request from a computer, you know, five milliseconds ago and decide not to let that request through again. Um, and it can build sort of a, set, a subset of information so that if it gets similar requests later on a year down the road or a month down the road, it can decide ahead of time, this same person's trying to do something bad, I don't want to let it through. And so it can actually keep services running uh, while filtering out essentially the bad. Um, and that's sort of the latest one. That's, uh, and when they get them all together, they call them a squid farm. When they get a bunch of servers together, it's, it's kind of neat. So, um, let's get down to this. When you write a paper you know, at the end of the term, what policies are you going to look at specifically that have you know, a pro and con side? The ones I want to focus on are the educational policies educational sort of focuses. So um, I want to look at how we're educating the personnel, um, how they're organized, where they're being employed at. Um, so is it, let's see, if, do they have 20 employees for one supervisor? Do those employees communicate on a regular basis? How do they communicate? Do they communicate with people from other departments who deal with similar situations? Um, I, wa I want to look at how isolated they are and why. And I, I want to, I want to, dig a little bit deeper into the methodologies about why um, a lot of people, a lot of politicians want to leave it at the status quo. A lot of them want to leave the organizational structure where it's at and not really focus on training them in the government so much as training them before they get there, which is a lot of where that NSF funding was coming from. Um, a lot of those ideas of saying, okay, well, if we, we pay students uh, competitive grants while they're in graduate degree programs, then we'll get you know people who have been in the field for longer, essentially, and people who have been studying the material longer, um, and it's competitive, so theoretically we'll be getting better employees, is the idea. Um, and then changing, uh, changing the structure of sort of the, the career track structure so that they can um, essentially you know, advance, uh, which is not exactly revolutionary, but something that probably should be done. And that's one of the recommendations that's been echoed.
that, as I said before, that, that these attacks are on specific targets. Most of them, yeah. Um, and the, the ones, the attacks on Georgia were very targeted, um, brought down the power grid. <laughs> this is another, this is another sort of coincidence that Russia was pointing out uh, that, you know, oh, don't blame us, we didn't do it. Um, but coincidentally, the power grid in one of the cities that they occupied immediately after crossing the border into Georgia was brought down as part of it. So whether or not that was just sort of a coincidental circumstance or whether or not a hacker specifically targeted that power grid to bring down seems a little strange. But um, you know, I mean, they, they, they are capable of targeting specific things, um, as nations are, um, or the attack of people who attack supporting nations, if you want to look at it that way. And then um, if you want to look at the attack that was, that's perpetrated more of like somebody who's just kind of clowning around, like the one on Independence Day is what um, generally people just sort of think of the, the people who did it as sort of, they didn't really have an ax to grind or anything like that, but they thought it might be fun and they, they were capable of it, so why not give it a try? Uh, one of the websites they brought down outside of the government was Amazon. So they weren't just targeting you know, the FBI or anything like that. That's just where most of the targets lay. Well, most of the big targets do have you know, monitoring systems. For this sort of thing. Yep. Um, but apparently not that effective. The NSA was uh, relatively untouched, which and means that whatever happened, they were prepared. They didn't really give any public statements into the NSA. Okay. So. They didn't black bag anybody, as far as I know. So <laughs> you know, it's, it's always a good, it's always a good sign. To your knowledge. Yeah, to my knowledge. Yeah, I hear they're pretty good at that. But. Other other question. Not a lot of questions. Anybody else? And if anybody has any input too on on if there's any other areas of uh, like educational training that they think I might want to um, focus on too, uh, I'm planning on picking. I used to be in education for a little while when I was an undergrad. So um, if anybody's got some ideas or.